Well, good evening. Very warm. Welcome to all of you here tonight. It's great to see each and every one of you here. Glad you have come to God's house tonight as we have this wonderful opportunity to worship him together. As we do that, as we gather in this place, God wants to greet his people. So if you would please stand to receive that greeting tonight. Well, congregation, God greets us this evening with these words. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you. From God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together a couple of uh, well-known songs, I think, To God Be the Glory, and we'll follow that up by singing, My God, How Wonderful You Are. Let's lift our voices in praise to God. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's pray together. 
God, it does bring great joy into our hearts to worship you and to know that you and you alone are God, the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And to rejoice tonight as we gather in your presence, because here as we come, we are bathed in your grace. Here as we come, we know a mercy and a faithfulness that is truly beyond our ability to comprehend. And God, you make yourself known to us. We are so very thankful for that. Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. We ask that you would bless it. We ask that you would open our hearts, open all that we are to what you have for us tonight. And that, God, we would be able to go into this week that you have prepared for us, ready to live for you and to shine brightly as your people for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we take the opportunity tonight to confess together what we believe. And for that, we'd like to use the words, uh, the familiar words of the Apostles' Creed. And following that uh, confession, we'll respond and sing together, I know not why God's wondrous grace. But let's begin with the Apostles' Creed. Let's say these words together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Well, 
Well, we're going to come before God in a time of prayer uh, together tonight. Uh, right before we do that, I certainly want to uh, uh, express my congratulations to everybody. We didn't falter when the screen gave out on us there. We did well. It means we know it by heart. We're not just depending on that screen, right? Uh, but as we uh, go to God with our praises and our requests, let's go to God in prayer together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be able to be called your children, to be known as your sons and your daughters, and to know that this is not of our doing, it is because of your wondrous grace that you've displayed in our lives. But to know that that grace qualifies us not only to be your children, your precious sons and daughters, but it allows us entrance into your presence at any moment of any day that we always have your full and undivided attention. Father, we come into your presence now. We've had a time of sharing the kinds of things that are going on in, in our lives as individuals or lives that we are connected with or in our life as a congregation. And Father, it uh, almost seems to be an understatement to say that there's lots going on. And Father, we know of, of many uh, who are hurting today in one way or the other. Now, some of them are, are dealing with cancer. We know about Bob Ritzma and Sherry too as they deal with these renewed cancer concerns for Bob and also uh, heart concerns too. Matt has shared with us about his mom Cindy and that her cancer is back. For Janelle... That cancer is back for her too. Father, these are difficult situations. And for each one, it's difficult news to hear. And, and we pray for them. And we pray that as now they are facing a new reality in life, God, we pray that you would lead them and that you would guide them. Father, we know you can do amazing things. We know that you could heal each and every one of these people if that was within the scope of your will. Father, at the same time, we understand that this, if, if this is not your will, that you will give a strength and you will give a great measure of grace to those who need it in special ways. Father, we pray too for, for Ralph, who's dealing with cancer in his body too. And as the doctors say, it is terminal. Father, we pray that you be with him, continue to protect him even as you did through a fall this past week. Father, be with him and with his wife as well as they, as they walk this road together. We think of others who have needs today, of Kim Gates, who's having back surgery on Thursday. We think of Sharon Lungyens and a pacemaker issue she's been having and eventually uh, going to need to be replaced. With Nancy Bartles and a broken wrist and upcoming surgery with Len Melling and dealing with a broken back. And we think of June as he's starting new treatments this week and we pray for those to be effective. And for Tom's wife, Yolanda, as she is continuing to recover. But Father, we're very grateful for the miracle you've done in her life. Continue to bless her, we pray, with health and strength. With Jim, with epilepsy issues as he's been dealing with these and the doctors are trying to discern exactly uh, how to help. Father, for Steve, too, and a heart condition. And uh, we pray, Lord, that as that surgery looms, that uh, you would grant your healing uh, for Steve, too. For Maurice's family, we continue to pray and, and the various uh, concerns and challenges that are there. And Father, we know that even... This is not an exhaustive list of things that, that are of concern to us, either individually or as a church family. And we pray, Father, that you, as you know us better than we know ourselves, that you would seek to answer every single need we have on, in the way that only you can. Father, too, on a, a general uh, way, we pray for our farmers around the area as they would seek to bring in their, their crop and just pray for drier weather, perhaps uh, slightly warmer too, uh, to help them out that they may be able to do what they, they need to do. 
And Father, through all of this, in terms of all of this that we raised you, we, we do that, again, recognizing that you are such a faithful God, that you never leave us and that you never forsake us. And, and Father, to know that it's not only those concerns that we can bring to you, but the joys in our hearts as well. And Father, certainly we have those. And we are so grateful for little Hadley, for Jeremy and Kaylee, as they've welcomed this new little one into their family. We just pray that you continue to bless Hadley with strength and, and with health and, Father, for the family together uh, to just uh, enjoy each other. We thank you, too, for a, a good ministry trip that Tom has experienced. Thankful that his meetings went well, both with the Muslim community and the Catholic community, too. And Father, we do pray in a very special way for Tom and Leslie together in their work with, with the persecuted at church and persecuted believers. And Father, even as we spent a, a moment this morning reflecting on that, uh, help us to bring that uh, to mind from time to time. And when we think of it, when the challenges uh, of the challenges that our brothers and sisters in Christ face throughout this world, that we would be le led to pray for them as well. And Father, knowing that you would hear and answer those prayers. Father, we're thankful too for uh, another day of worship that you have granted us. For this Sabbath day, this one in seven that you have set aside is different. That we can pause from the daily activities and daily concerns of life. We can gather with your people. We can lift up our praises to you. We can exalt you. Father, worship as you desire and certainly as you deserve. So we are so thankful for that. Father, we ask that you be with us and... The rest of our service tonight as we again look into your word and consider what our Heidelberg Catechism teaches us as well, that, Lord, you would open our minds and our hearts to that too. But most of all, Father, we are grateful, grateful for your grace, grateful for your love, grateful for your mercy and your faithfulness. And it's in that gratitude, Father, that we, we close our prayer and in that gratitude that we want to live our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So at this time we have the opportunity to give of our gifts. The offering for tonight is for the Holland and Zeeland Christian Schools. And may we give as God leads us to do that this evening. Well, as we prepare to listen to God's word tonight, we want to sing together a couple of verses of Rock of Ages, a cleft for me. So let's stand as we sing together. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles out and turn there with me, if you would, to 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 4 through 12, uh, specifically tonight. 
as we continue in a, a study, an overview study of the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, that study entitled Questions Worth Answering. And tonight we're going we're gonna to think about good works. So that's, uh, that's really the context of where this scripture is going to help us out. We're also going to be looking at Lord's Days 32 and 33. So if you have a free hand or if you have a, an open spot on the bench next to you, you can haul out your Psalter hymnal as well. Turn in the back there to page 901. And you're going to find there Lord's Day 32 and just flip the page and you'll find Lord's Day 33. Much of those Lord's Days are going to be on the screen behind me as well. But if you want to see the the full extent of them, uh, they're right there beginning on page 901. First Peter, our text there, is on page 1204 in your pew Bibles. And uh, tonight, as we get into this, just a, a note that we are now entering into officially... Uh, The third main section of the Heidelberg Catechism, Uh, we of course, I'm sure, remember that breakdown of the three main sections, sin, salvation, and service, or guilt, grace, and gratitude. So we are heading into that third section, that uh, that service section, or that gratitude section. So that just locates us a little bit uh, in the Catechism. So looking at 1 Peter... Uh, Chapter 2, verses 4 through 12, here Peter writes, is carried along by the Holy Spirit. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture... Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. So as far as we want to read in God's word tonight, and may he bless his word to us this evening. Well, congregation, back on October 20, I realize that's almost a month ago now, but way back on October 20, we took a look at Lord's Days 23 and 24, and we took up the topic of faith alone. And maybe, perhaps, uh, you remember some of that, but in the midst of that study, we were presented with this biblical teaching that sinners are made right solely and exclusively on the basis of God's grace and faith in Jesus Christ, that this is the only way of salvation, right? Even as we've, we've touched on that in song, in the various songs that we've even sung tonight, that this is the only way of salvation, right? Paul made that abundantly clear for us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's not as a result of work so that no one can boast. So the Bible is very clear, even as the catechism is, that there is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. There's nothing we can do. Try as hard as we might There's nothing we can do to to have God say, oh, I think I'm just going to forgive him because he is such a great person. There's nothing we can do. Nothing we can do to earn that forgiveness. Nothing we can do to earn that everlasting life. Uh, Scripture teaches us, the catechism reminds us, 
Question and answer 62. A little bit of ways ago that we looked at it. Even the very best we do in life is imperfect and it's stained with sin. So bottom line is we said salvation is a matter of faith alone and not a matter of faith and. Now as clear as that is, Nevertheless, it does seem to stir up quite a big hornet's nest when it comes to the, the place of good works in the life of a believer, the place that good works have in our lives as believers. Because after all, if good works do absolutely nothing to help or gain or have us somehow earn salvation, then the question inevitably comes up, well, why do them? Why do good works at all? What's the point? Right? The conclusion of Lord's Day 24, way back when we looked at it, even echoes that statement, that sentiment, and this is what it says. Well, doesn't this teaching, this teaching of salvation by faith alone, doesn't this teaching make people indifferent and wicked? So again, it's basically asking, what's the point? Why do good works? Well, in that respect, there are three things that we want to recognize tonight. Beginning with the fact that good works are natural in the life of a believer. Right? Even as the closing words of Lord's Day 24 tell us, it is impossible for those grafted into Christ by true faith not to produce works of gratitude. And then following up on that is the opening words of Lord's Day 32 declare in response to the question, why then must we still do good? It says we do good because Christ by his spirit is renewing us to be like himself so that, so that in all our living we may show that we are thankful to God for all that he's done for us. In other words, even as water just kind of naturally flows downhill, our good works flow out of gratitude to God. I mean, just think about it. Think of all the amazing things that God has done for us. Again, we, we sang about some of those things. I know not why God's wondrous grace, you know, to God be the glory, the vilest offender who truly believes has salvation, right? All of this by God. He has done this for us. He's given us salvation. Peter, in our text for tonight, says, hey, this is, what, this is what God has done for you. Once you weren't a people, now you're a people. Once you were in darkness, now you're in light. He says, God in Christ, he has made you to be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession." So the fundamental reason why we do good works is to express our gratitude to God. Our good works are the natural response to God's grace. Pastor Lou Vandermeer, who is the video teacher in my 11th and 12th grade catechism class, and a few of them are chuckling already back there, has a little illustration of this that I want to share with you. Now, for those who are in my 11th and 12th grade catechism class who haven't heard this yet, it's coming, so just kind of tuck it away. But this is the illustration that he has to help us kind of understand this, okay? So he says, now we have uh, two houses next to each other. Uh, one, there's a young boy who lives there. Then there's the neighbor man. He says, the young boy just loved to bounce his hard rubber ball against the house of his neighbor. Just bounce his ball over and over. And for the most part, the neighbor man didn't care about that. That was fine. But the neighbor man did warn the young boy to be careful of the big plate glass window that was right close to where the boy liked to bounce his ball. Well, one day, you can guess where this is going, right? The boy bounces that hard rubber ball, goes right through that plate glass, plate glass window. So the neighbor man comes running out. He sees the shattered window. He's all up in arms. He's yelling at the boy. About that time, the neighbor man's son comes out of the house. He kind of sees his dad. He sees the boy. He sees the broken window. He puts two and two together, understands what's going on. 
He goes over to the young boy and his dad. He kind of separates them. He reminds them, hey, this is not how we act. We're friends. We're neighbors. We don't act this way. The neighbor man calmed down, even gave the boy a hug. Well, at that point, the boy turns around to leave, thinking that everything's okay. Everything's back to normal. But as the boy's walking away, the neighbor man calls out and says, hey, what about the window? I, I've forgiven you, but you've got to pay for the window. And the boy didn't know what to do with that. He said, I, I don't have any money. I can't possibly pay for this big, expensive window. My parents can't possibly pay for that. I, I can't do it. And the neighbor man says, well, then you're going to have to work in my garden day after day until you have paid the price of that window. And hearing that, the young boy's face just dropped because he knew a, a window like that would take a lifetime to try and pay off, probably even more than a lifetime. Now the neighbor man's son comes on the scene again and he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out this big wad of money. He says, Dad, I've got some money. I'd like to pay for that window on behalf of this young boy. And the father says, okay. And things go back to normal between the neighbor man and the young boy, except that the young boy now starts to work in the garden. And he weeds and he makes the garden look nice and at the time when the tomatoes are ready, he picks them and he brings them into his neighbor. Not because he has to, but because he wants to. Because he wants to express just how grateful he truly is. Now, I'll be the first to admit that that's not a perfect illustration. I understand that. But I think it does get the point across. You see, salvation is totally a matter of grace through faith in Jesus Christ, completely and absolutely. It is only by grace through faith. But the fact of the matter is, once we have experienced that salvation, we want to respond. We want to do good. So Kevin DeYoung puts it this way in his commentary on the catechism. He says, we do good because the wonder of our salvation produces such thankfulness in our hearts that it is our pleasure to serve God. So that's number one. That's the first thing that we want to understand. It is a very basic, very fundamental thing to know that good works are natural in our lives as believers. But as the catechism goes on to point out to us, good works are also necessary in our lives as believers. In other words, even though good works are the fruit of gratitude, that they flow out of thankfulness, nevertheless, at the same time, they have to be there. Those good works are necessary, as Lord's Day 32 says, they assure us of our faith. And as Lord's Day 33 then goes on to teach us, these good works prove that our conversion is genuine. That's the word that the catechism uses, genuine. Prove that our conversion is genuine, that more and more our old self is dying away, that more and more the new self is coming to life, that more and more we are cultivating a hatred for sin, and that more and more we are delighting to do every kind of good as God wants us to. Now along these lines, the New Testament letter of James is often referred to, and Many of you likely know that James, in general, is very heavy into the, the good works aspect, so much so that the great reformer Martin Luther, he even wondered, he kind of questioned, should James even really be in the Bible? Should it be included in the canon? Because it seems at points to teach that salvation is a matter of faith and works. 
But that's really not at all what James is saying. Instead, James is simply pointing out the necessity of good works in the life of a believer. So listen, for example, what James says in the midst of chapter 2. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? James says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So you can sense, I'm sure, why Luther struggled a little bit with James here. But essentially what James is saying is this, as Kevin DeYoung puts it here, he says, faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone. And I want to say that one more time so that it just begins to sink into us here. Faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone. In other words, salvation is always and only a matter of faith alone in Jesus. It is never a matter of faith and works, but at the same time, faith and works are never divorced from each other either. Right? Good works are necessary in our lives as believers. They assure us of our salvation, and they also are the proof that our conversion is genuine. All right, finally, let's also recognize that good works are noticed in our lives as believers, right? They're obviously noticed by God, but they are also, and very significantly, noticed by those around us, and particularly those who are unbelievers, those who at this point are outside of the kingdom of God. So we do good works, as Lord's Day 32 says, so that by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. And that's really finally where Peter lands in our text in verses 4 through 12. This is finally where he lands. Here at verse 12, the last verse, this is what he says. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now that is very much akin to what Jesus himself said. Right? Think back to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. Listen to what Jesus says to his followers. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. No, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, says Jesus, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So the point, I think, is very, very clear for us. Our good works serve as a witness as to the validity of the gospel. And think about it. Isn't this exactly what unbelievers so often come back at us with? Right? So often they'll say, what you do doesn't match what you profess to believe. What what you do doesn't match what you say. And because of that, I don't want anything to do with Christianity. And what do they say? You're all a bunch of hypocrites. Right? That's what it always comes back to. Most of the time. Now, we know it's not usually that simple when it comes to hypocrisy. That hypocrisy really, you know, it's not that simple based on what we do or don't do. However, it does speak to the influence of our actions. And just as surely when our good deeds match the good news that we declare, well, then people have an open ear. Then they'll they'll be much more apt to listen and much more understanding here of the transformational nature of the gospel. And make no mistake about it, people around you, they're watching you. If they're unbelievers and they know you go to church, they know that on Sunday morning or Sunday evening, your car is pulling out of the driveway and you're going to church. Your classmates, your coworkers, they know that you profess to be a Christian. They're watching you. 
And they want to see if what you say matches, if what you do matches what you say. That's what they want to see. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't, then we're effectively pushing them away. But when it does, well, again, then they're much more apt to listen to what we have to say because they can see that it actually makes a difference in our lives. My good works are noticed in our lives as believers. You know, I mentioned it at the outset, but just to re-emphasize it for us, we, we are now into that third and final main section of the Heidelberg Catechism, that section on service or, or gratitude. And what we've talked about tonight, it is absolutely foundational to understand. It's absolutely important. Why do good works? That it really all comes back to gratitude. Right? It's about our response of thankfulness to the grace that God has shown to us in Jesus. It's our natural response. But to understand as well that it's, these good works are also necessary in our lives as believers. And they're noticed, right? They're noticed. And they can afford us wonderful opportunities to declare the gospel. And in that, I think it's probably healthy for each and every one of us to really consider our own lives and to ask ourselves what could potentially be some hard questions. Why do I live the way that I live? Why do I do the things that I do? Why do I seek to do good works? Right? Why do I volunteer at church? Why do I teach Sunday school? Why do I come out for the Wednesday activities and help put dinner together? Why would I come out on Saturday morning uh, to bring basket stuff over to, Bra to Bravo? Why would I do that? Why do I do good works? I am I trying in some way to earn my salvation? Am I trying in some way to, to pay God back for what he's given to me? Or do I just want to say thank you? Do I want to do it because it is my pleasure to serve the God who has given his grace in my life and saved me in such an astounding way? Do I want to make sure that, that I'm assured of my salvation, that I, that I prove the genuineness of my conversion? Do I want to perhaps have an opportunity to interact with an unbeliever? And share with them about the transformational nature of the gospel. In light of what both scripture and the catechism teach us. May we always seek to do those good works. For the right reasons. And in the right way. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to once again tonight dig into the catechism and to understand its teaching more and more as it's drawn for us out of scripture. And Father, to, to think tonight specifically about why we would do good works when they don't contribute anything whatsoever to our salvation, but to be reminded that good works are important in our lives as believers. They should be the natural uh, outpouring of gratitude for the grace that we have received. But to understand, too, that they're, they're necessary in our lives. And that they are noticed in our lives, too. So, Father, help us, even as we perhaps consider for ourselves some of the questions that have been raised tonight. That ultimately we discover that we want to do these good works for the right reasons and in the right way. Ultimately to bring glory to you and to lift up the name of our Savior Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
Well, we're going to respond and sing together a few verses of Take My Life and Let It Be. Let's stand as we sing. Take my closing song tonight is going to be lead me guide me before we sing together God gives to us his parting blessing receive that blessing now may the love of God the father and the grace of Jesus Christ the son the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore amen